now I just want to touch on open confirm. This one is lighter weight because we've already done all of the client state and consensus state verification that could possibly need to be done. So now all we need to do is we need to verify that the counterparty is in open. So the counterparty is in uh, open and we're in try open and we want to go ahead and finish this handshake. So we need to just get this expected um, connection end, which we expect to be in open with all our information and we verify this connection state. This is also imp important for the version negotiation because if we remember the version is selected in um, open try and it's finally agreed upon in open ACK. But when we do our open confirm, we need to make sure that they didn't try to switch up the version in open ACK, that they actually followed with what the specification has. And so that is also another reason why verifying this connection state in open confirm is useful. And if all of that works out, we found the right match and uh, they expect to have an open communication with us, then we can go ahead and open, set our state to open and we can begin talking. And the next step after connection is to actually agree about something to talk about. And that's what happens in the channel handshake. Cool. Any questions about all of this? I know this has probably been a lot in an hour and a half. Yeah, I found it super helpful to be honest. Um, very interesting. I was going to ask, um, so crossing hellos in the context of channel handshakes also, like as, a, as an IVC app developer, do you need to be super careful about like crossing hellos on your channel handshake for like if you were developing your own IBC app? Yes, um, you need to be careful. You probably don't need to be super careful because I think the channel handshake will just fail if you do something wrong. Oh, but okay. you do need to be aware that crossing hellos is a thing. And the primary consideration this occurs is when claiming capabilities. Um, so it's very interesting with transfers versus interchain accounts. Because transfers, crossing hellos can occur because both sides are using the same code. There isn't a specified controller or host chain, depending on which step you're on. So in it could happen, you could claim the capability, and then you could end up calling open try, and you could try claiming that same capability, but you've already claimed it. So in the transfer code, we actually have a check there that says, did we claim this capability because of crossing hellos? If we did, then we just like want to make sure that it's the correct capability, but we don't try to like claim it again. But in the interchain accounts case, you don't actually need that check because it's the controller chain that does in it and it's the host chain that does open try. So the crossing hellos isn't actually possible because if you tried to do it, you would just be do creating two separate uh, uh, notions from the interchain account perspective, right? Right. Yeah. You'd be doing in it, creating a new controller account, and then you'd be doing open try, but that's like associated with the controller account on a different chain. So you're not actually performing the crossing hello for the same channel. Yeah, it makes sense. Cool. Um, I, sorry. Go ahead, if you have any questions, there's only one last thing I think I could talk about. Uh, no, it's not a question, but maybe, um, maybe um, something that I noticed is that it, it looks like uh, within the same, let's say, function, uh, like a connection open in it or something, something sometimes counterparty means, means something different, right? It's not like in the, in the let's say, in the try, uh, sorry, uh, in the try, counterparty always means uh, swampy, but counterparty also can mean sometimes blomore, right? Yeah, I totally know what you mean, where it has like counterparty and then it has like expected counterparty. And that yeah. can be like very confusing. Yeah, yeah. I found that a, a bit confusing, but okay. Yeah, I completely agree. Mm -hmm. um, that's my, that might even be like a nit we had come up when we did the audit. Is it like, I definitely like have to reread some of this code like five times because yeah. of that. So we could, definitely could improve the naming. I think there's a lot of stuff here when I'm looking through this code again that like could be refactored, clean up. I also think the documentation, the Go doc should be a lot better we don't have much information here, even though like 
the open ACK is doing like a lot of verification. We have the specs, but I still think the Go doc could be improved. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, well, we have a couple minutes left. Something I'd like to briefly talk about is this block delay. Um, so this is important for the channel um, when we're processing packets. And I'm going to state all this information. It's probably going to make not is is probably is not going to make sense. But I encourage you to kind of read the Go doc later to fully understand what's happening. So we want to create a delay, a potential delay from when our light client is updated and from when we process a packet on that light client. And this goes back to the question that Sean had, which is how does a light client attack work? And a light client attack works by up fooling a light client to update to this fake information and then processing a packet against that fake information. But if we can't process any packets against that fake information, it doesn't really matter that they fooled the light client because we might be able to freeze the light client before it processes any packets against that fake information. And that's what the block delay is doing, is it's trying to create a way at the connection level that we can have some sort of standardized block delay between updating a consensus state and processing packets against it. And the way we do this is we have a global parameter for a chain which specifies the expected time per block. So if you asked me, what's the expected time per block for the hub? I might say eight seconds or seven seconds. It's somewhere around there. At some point, it might have been five. But the general idea is, how often is a block usually produced? And we take this information, and we derive the amount of blocks that we should wait based on the time delay specified in the connection. So if you remember when we looked at the protofiles, there was this type, which was the delay period in the connection. And what we're doing is we're taking this delay period, which uh, let's say is in seconds. I believe it's in nanoseconds. But let's say it's in seconds. So let's say my delay period is 24. So I say I want a connection with a delay period of 24 seconds. And we're taking the expected time per block, and let's say it's eight. And we do 24 divided by eight, and we get three. And that means three blocks must be committed on our chain before we can do packet processing against the consensus state that was updated. So a relayer updates our client with a consensus state at, uh, with a consensus state. And basically what ha needs to happen is we need to commit three blocks. This has nothing to do with the counterparty and um, the consent which the count consensus state is representing. This is someone updated our client. And now based on this calculation, we're going to wait three blocks before we allow any packet processing against that consensus state. And this is because the counterparty you know, this might be a, uh, they might have been updated to a compromised consensus state. So we can't rely on them to enforce this delay. This needs to be our delay because we can trust ourselves. And so we wait three blocks. Once those three blocks happen, then packet processing can begin occurring against that consensus state. Currently in the Stargate version of IBC, this didn't exist. So uh, currently all connections probably have a uh, zero uh, delay period. Basically, no, no blocks need to be committed before you can process packets. You can update a client and begin processing packets right away. But maybe in the future, we'll see a little bit more secure connections that allow, give a little bit more of a buffer for submitting evidence against a, mis a client which is misbehaving. Cool. So I think that's all I'm going to say, unless anyone has questions. Um, sorry. Go, Damien. Yeah. You sure? <laughs> I was just gonna say. Um, so, I think last week um, Didier was saying that uh, Hermes, for example, sends an update client along with every packet, right? So, if this delay period did evaluate to, you know, twenty-four divided by eight, three blocks. So, you know, you've got to wait three blocks then before that packet is actually processed, right? Correct. And that could be roughly 25, 30 seconds or so. Correct. Um, and if Hermes did try to submit that, uh, the update, 
and the packet processing within the same transaction, the entire transaction would fail. So this is something that relayers need to be able to support. So if we wanted to do like full like end to end like integration tests programmatically, let's say, and write some code that invoked some transaction and then was relayed and this delay period was such a thing, we'd need to kind of account for that delay, right? Yeah, you need a queuing system. The assumption at the moment is that this queuing system is submitted to the relayers. Right. So when so, the relayers see the event to relay, they generate the consensus state they want to use for proofs, and then they queue the actual uh, packet commitments and acknowledgments that they want to prove. And once the blocks are committed, then it submits those transactions. Right. So if I was to write a test, I'd need to like delay before I query the state um, and make assertions. You could, um, you don't need to delay before you query the state. What you need to delay on is actually submitting the transaction that you've um, generated. Okay. So the transaction only fails before the um, time delay passes because there's an explicit check, checking that the time delay has passed. But all the other parameters, such as like the proof and stuff, could still be absolutely correct. Right. So you can generate the relay messages as they occur. It's just if you submit them, they'll fail because the time hasn't passed. But, but the time delay, is it configurable? Uh, per connection. Per connection. Okay, so, so if we want to do an integration test, we could also configure it to zero uh, so that we don't need to wait or? Correct. That's what all of them are currently set to. I'm pretty sure it might be. I think it, it must be the case that we did Stargate with this parameter. I just don't know if we had any checks in place for the Stargate version. Mm -hmm. the, but in this version, we've introduced, in the IBC Go version, we've introduced the uh, expected time per block in order to do this calculation. And this was important for the light client attack, right? A, yes, this is important for the light client attack. And, and how, 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 I, I don't see it. Uh, I mean, why? Yeah, I don't see the why, yeah. Yeah, so a light client attack, there's no way we can actually prevent that from occurring. So it's always possible that a light client could be attacked with a large enough a malicious validator set. So we can't actually prevent it. Um, we can see that a light client has been malicious and freeze it. But when, what is not a very good defense mechanism is always doing things after the fact. Like if you can't do any preventative measures, then that always leaves the ball field open for someone to actually steal all the money and get away with it. You can't just be like, oops, they stole the money and then like freeze everything and uh, hope that's all right when they already took all the money. So what we can do is introduce this new defense mechanism, which is basically saying, um, basically giving us a time period to actually submit evidence against this misbehaving client. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, so it's basically like someone's like, okay, I'm going to rob this bank. And instead of them just saying, I'm going to rob this bank and doing it, we actually get like a day to like have that word pass around and then like figure out their plans before they actually do it. Okay, yeah. But but, but in this case, uh, if, we, if we don't want to delay the processing of packets like for a day, uh, yeah. the, the idea is that the connection, the delay period should be associated with the level of security you want for that connection. So okay. you can imagine like if I'm doing an IBC transfer of like a million dollars, I might be totally fine waiting a day, right? Because yeah, I don't want yeah. my money stolen. But if I'm just like sending five bucks, you know, then maybe I don't want, care about this like security because I'm like, yeah, if my money gets stolen, whatever. So the idea is that you would have multiple connections in these cases based on the desired um, delay period. Yeah, okay. There's yeah. been more talk of kind of having this delay period kind of be more, at, there's a lot of talk of how to do this. It's kind of a tricky thing to do. And like in the ideal scenario, you could have like buffering at the transfer level where if like someone's trying to transfer large amounts, it like slows down. And there's like a little like a little bit of a valve happening there, but then you have like Oracle information and stuff like that. So it gets super complex. 
So we just kind of went with the basic one, which is allowing for a connection to specify how many blocks could uh, be, how many blocks should be committed before we can pass it, process packets. But it's possible in the future we'll do this on a per packet level um, where mm -hmm. you can delay, you can have various delays depending on the packet. Mm -hmm. And what happens if the, if the relayer doesn't respect that delay, so yeah, if the relayer that decides to go go ahead and yeah, update the, the client and send the packet, the code will error. Okay, um, and I can probably show you where it will. It should happen. the The light client should take care of it. Okay. Okay. So I can quickly show that. I think it's at the, it's here. Um, verify delay period pass. Mm -hmm. So when it tries to do any of the proof verification, if the delay period hasn't passed, then this will turn return an error. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, and what happens if, if there are many, um, like, like many packet transfers uh, happening, uh, and the and the relayer needs to update the, the light client. Uh, does that mean that all those packets are, are getting delayed because you get like a consecutive uh, like consecutive update clients? Uh, all of them are getting delayed by the delay period. But it's possible to verify if. Um, if a packet gets sent at block one, a packet gets sent at block two, a packet gets sent at block three, yeah, you can verify all those packets at block five. Mm -hmm. You can still batch all of those if you want to. The relayer mm -hmm. doesn't have to submit a consensus state for each block a packet is sent in. But whatever mm -hmm. consensus state the relayer decides to do, that consensus state needs to wait the delay period. But then once that delay period passes, you could verify all of those other packets against it. Mm -hmm.